Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. A power couple, a celebrity world, a rom-com. Their relationship is no secret. In the space of only a couple months, they have dominated headlines and have kept their relationship widely blossoming with gossip. Things are seen to be escalating quickly. And for Taylor and Travis, anything in future is possible. Take a slide over for us. Guys, guys, don't go forward. Don't go forward. Hey, Travis. Hey, Taylor. Looking amazing. Swift and Kelsey have been dating since the latter part of 2023. Swift is said to have opened up about her relationship with Kelsey when she was named Times Person of the Year 2023. It all started in 2016, when Kelsey plays Kiss, Marry, Kill in an interview, with the choices being Ariana Grande, Katy Perry and Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift being the Kiss ended up gaining traction as the interview resurfaced in 2023. Damn, that's <laughs> messed up. I don't want to kill any of them. Well, um, you know, um, it's just a game. Uh, just a game. Uh, it's going to be harder kill. to find real love. Uh, this you got to play yeah. this game. Right? So what is it, kill? Kill, marry, Ari kiss. Ariana is okay. kill, <laughs> okay. unfortunately. Love you, but you're, you're gone. Okay. Um, and then uh, Taylor Swift would be the kiss. And then Katy Perry, what's the last one? Katy Perry. Katy Perry would marry. be the, yeah, Katy marry, Perry, Perry would be the He's man. like, yeah. Kelsey is believed to have discussed shooting his shot in July of 2023, while he attended one of her tour shows with his brother. His remarks are said to have gotten media pickup. He says that he is disappointed that Taylor doesn't seem to talk before or after her shows, as she saves her voice for the songs that she sings. In one Taylor concert, Kelsey wanted to hand Swift a friendship bracelet, but this one with his number on it. I'm having a blast. I'm, I'm surprised that my legs aren't hurting yet. I'm surprised that there's no aching going on. Um, I'm, I'm really having so much fun because like, we're all having a really good time today and they're all telling me really sweet stories and they've given, look at all the bracelets that all the girls have given me today. This is just today. And um, I don't know, this is just, this has been one of the coolest days I can remember. And that is all for this edition of Dateline Sunday. We will see you again for Dateline Friday at 9, 8 central. I hope it's hot thing for and for all the NBC news. We have my phone, which <laughs> I've never had let anyone touch this phone pretty much, so it was only for Taylor. And then my hand, which that's never ever coming off. That's If I could get it tattooed there, I would. Travis Michael Kelsey is an American football tight end for the Kansas City Chiefs of the National Football League. He was born in 1989 in Westlake, Ohio, his father, Ed Kelsey, is a sales representative in the steel industry, and his mother, Donna, is a former bank executive. His brother, Jason, is also a professional football player who plays center for the Philadelphia Eagles. He attended Cleveland Heights High School, where he was a three-sport athlete in basketball, football, and baseball. Excelling exceptionally well at football, he became a three-year letter winner as quarterback. I stand by that this team has every piece that it needs to be great. You know, everybody can talk about whatever they want to talk about. That's our weakness. Um, I know that we got a team that could put points up. And I know we got the coaches to be able to put us in the great position to succeed. And, um, and that's where we're moving going forward. Uh, and I, it just takes guys to, to lock in and just be ready for those big-time moments uh, when we need them most. Considered a two-star recruit, Kelsey went on to accept a scholarship offer from University of Cincinnati 
over three other offers. Their motto, Alta Petite, Seek the Highest, would eventually be attained by the rising star, but not before a steep learning curve. A curve that derailed his quest for success. Kelsey embraced the more edgy side of a college lifestyle and engaged in many activities that would later bring him back down to earth and would ultimately make the young Travis hit rock bottom. Kelsey loved to party, but his partying exploits under the night sky on the streets of Cincinnati would very quickly come to haunt him. But with a state of adversity comes the opportunity to look inward, renew and reform. From the highs of sealing an unbeaten season and an appearance in the 2009-2010 Sugar Bowl, the Cincinnati Bearcat faced the unimaginable for an aspiring NFL star. Travis was pulled into the coach's office for breaking university protocol and withdrew his scholarship, dropping him from the University of Cincinnati after posting a positive drug test for cannabis. Having reached rock bottom, there was only one direction the aspiring athlete could go, up. Travis moved in with his brother, who steered him onto the straight and narrow path, convincing the new coach, Butch Jones, to supply him with one chance of redemption. A decision he would never regret. But for Travis to succeed, there were guidelines to not miss a single class and maintain a 3.0 record. Struggling to fund his studies, the aspiring star turned to telemarketing to pay for college. The hard work and newfound discipline paid off, earning Travis a spot on the new team. It was evident that football was in the brother's DNA. Celebrations of his brother's sixth round NFL draft pick to the Philadelphia Eagles only fueled Travis's fire to attain the same. Having played quarterback his whole life, Travis returned to the first team in the fall, but in a different role, tight end. His athletic performances caught the attention of some of the NFL scouts as he was named CFP Tight End of the Year. However, as his Dan Patrick show appearance suggested, others took a different point of view. All right, weakness. Doesn't have blazing speed. Not a tremendously explosive athlete. Doesn't come out of his breaks that well. Plays with the pedal to the metal, which isn't always a good thing. He doesn't run a wide variety of routes. Doesn't display sudden or sharp breaks in routes. Character is a big question. Despite his ability, his personality and character had many doubt his viability to succeed at the pinnacle of the sport. Kelsey went on to take part in many seasons from 2013. His lifelong dedication to sports and football has won him many fans across the globe. 2013 NFL Draft. Names that Travis thought were worse players than him came and went. As the draft dwindled and hope of attaining his dream began to evaporate, his phone rang. With the 63rd pick in the 2013 NFL Draft, the Kansas City Chiefs select Travis Kelsey, tight end, Cincinnati. <laughs> Andy Reid, who had signed his older brother to the Eagles two years prior, welcomed another from the Kelsey dynasty, this time with the Kansas City Chiefs. Optimism was high for his rookie season, but one stroke of bad luck 
turned his triumphant success on its head. During preseason, Kelsey suffered a bone bruise in his knee that led to him featuring in only one special team's snap all season long. The young tight end had a point to prove in his first injury-free season. Kelsey scored his first touchdown in week three and never looked back, as he ended the 2014 season as the Chiefs' leading receiver. Smith, touchdown! He is considered one of the greatest tight ends of all time, holding an NFL record for most consecutive and most overall seasons with 1,000 yards receiving by a tight end with seven. He also briefly held the single season record in 2018 before it was broken later that same day. During the 2022 season, Kelsey became the fastest tight end to reach 10,000 career receiving yards, and he became the fifth tight end in NFL history to reach the milestone. He was named to NFL 2010's All-Decade Team. Outside of football, Kelsey has appeared on reality and scripted television and in advertisements. He co-hosts the podcast New Heights with his brother Jason, covering a range of topics from football to popular culture. He also has his own clothing line, True Colours, which was created to connect people through colours and give them a way to express themselves. Kelsey's jersey sales from this line and individual celebrity status increased, following publicity of a relationship with singer-songwriter Taylor Swift. see singers on TV playing concerts or music videos and stuff, I, I would always think to myself, if, if I was ever lucky enough by some crazy, crazy chance I could ever do that, I would want to sign autographs all day, every day for anybody who wanted one. And I'd want to take pictures with everybody. And, you know, I just, I wanted to say thank you for all the stuff that they've done for me, you know. They've made my life really fun. One of the great virtues in country music is humility. You can fake humility and pretend to be humble, but you can't do that for very long. You honestly do have to have humility to be a country star, to be able to say, look, here I am, I'm laying myself in front of you, I hope you like me, because I'm not better than you, I am you. You know, I'm not singing about things that are alien to you. I'm trying to sing things that you feel as I do. Um, that sense of humility of, of I'm not better than the audience is very, very deep and very, very profound in the culture. One of the interesting things about Taylor is that she is both this massive star, but her audience feels like she's almost their best friend. I, I think Taylor understands her brand better than maybe anybody else out there, and she understands just how much her success relies on the people that listen to her music, and, and she makes a point of making them feel like they're in the game and that they are that they are contributing to her success. Uh, you know, when there's a fan voted award show and she wins, she makes a point of thanking everybody. She makes a point of acting the way that you would think somebody would act if they had just won some huge award. And, and so the fans always feel like they are that they are part of her story as well as watching the story play out. I'm having a blast. I'm, I'm surprised that my legs aren't hurting yet. I'm surprised that there's no aching going on. Um, I'm, I'm really having so much fun because, like, 
we're all having a really good time today and they're all telling me really sweet stories and they've given look at all the bracelets that all the girls have given me today this is just today and um, I don't know this is just this has been one of the coolest days I can remember Taylor Swift was born on December 13th 1989 in Reading Pennsylvania Swift and her brother were raised in the Presbyterian faith and attended Vacation Bible School every summer. Well, Taylor Swift, known as America's Sweetheart, really did have very much an idyllic American childhood. I mean, she grew up on a Christmas tree farm, for heaven's sake, with a very close family unit. Her dad's a stockbroker. She has one brother, Austin, very close with her family. Taylor has said repeatedly her mom is her best friend. When Swift was nine years old, the family moved to a rented house in the suburban town of Wyomissing, Pennsylvania. It was there where she attended Wyomissing Area Junior School. At the age of seven, Swift became interested in musical theater and performed in numerous Burke's Youth Theater Academy productions. Swift later turned her attention to country music with Shania Twain being one of her biggest influences. Shania has a very glamorous look and a lot of fun with her videos, and I think Taylor likes that. The other thing is Shania sings a lot about real life, what she's gone through herself, very honest and open ballads, and I think Taylor resonates with that as well. She would spend her weekends performing at local festivals, coffee houses, fairs, karaoke concerts, garden clubs, Boy Scout meetings and sporting events. She later went on to win a local talent competition and was given the opportunity to appear as the opening act for Charlie Daniels at a Straustown amphitheater at the age of 11. As years went by, she began to develop a profound love for music. And after watching a Behind the Music episode about Faith Hill, Swift felt sure she needed to go to Nashville to pursue her own music career. She traveled with her mother to submit a demo of Dolly Parton and Dixie Chicks karaoke covers with record labels along Music Row. And I remember talking to her about how she would walk down the street in, in Nashville. It's called Music Row because all the um, music companies, uh, record labels, publishers, uh, there's a uh, vast array of them all along the same street. So you can just go up and down the street and hit all these different companies. And she would go from door to door, knocking on the doors and go, hi, I'm Taylor, I write songs. Um, would you give me a deal? And, you know, at, at that point, an 11-year-old isn't, isn't gonna get much credibility, uh, but she kept at it. Nashville is the last place, I believe, not just in America, but in the world, where the craft of songwriting is nurtured and respected and loved. And I, by, the, by songwriting, I don't mean, mm, baby, mm, baby, mm. That's a song in LA. It is not a song in Nashville. That just will not do. You know, you are supposed to say something when you sing in a club in Nashville. Anybody that wants to be a country singer has to come through Nashville. Uh, you, don't, you don't have to always live in Nashville once you've become a successful country singer, but it's almost impossible to do it without living here at some point. What I always like to say is that the difference between Nashville and Los Angeles and New York is that in Nashville, at least they'll listen to you before they tell you no. After receiving numerous rejections, she realized she had to change her style in order to be noticed. When she was just the tender age of 12, she was taught how to play three chords on a guitar, inspiring her to write her first song, Lucky You. In 2003, Swift and her parents started working with New York-based music manager, Dan Dimtro. With Dimtro's help, Swift modeled for Abercrombie and Fitch as part of their Rising Stars campaign. 
had an original song included on a Maybelline compilation CD and attended meetings with major record labels. After performing original songs at an RCA Records showcase, the eighth grader was given an artist development deal and began making frequent trips to Nashville with her mother. In order to help Taylor break into country music, her father transferred to the Nashville office of Merrill Lynch and the family relocated to a lakefront house in Hendersonville, Tennessee. She attended Hendersonville High School for her freshman and sophomore years. Later, to accommodate her touring schedule, Swift transferred to the Aaron Academy, a private Christian school which offered homeschooling services. Swift then moved to Nashville when she was just 13 years old, having signed an artist development deal with RCA Records. Well, for me, you know, the, the long period of time occurred from when I was 10 years old to when I was about 15. I mean, I spent that entire time trying to get a record deal and um, actually moved to Nashville when I was 13 and it didn't get a record deal right away. It didn't get a record deal at all, so I signed a publishing deal and became a staff songwriter at Sony ATV Publishing. And so I would write every single day after school because it was a it was a job, you know. I was I was a paid songwriter when I was 14, so I wrote songs in Nashville for two and a half years. She proceeded to work with experienced Music Row songwriters, and eventually formed a lasting working relationship with Liz Rose. Swift saw Rose performing at an RCA songwriter event, and suggested that they write together. I remember uh, Jody Williams, uh, who at that time was Liz Rose's uh, song publisher. And he said something to Liz like, why are you wasting your time with this 14-year-old kid? And Liz said to him, she pulls her own weight. In a, in a songwriting session, she's no kid. And that, I thought that little anecdote right there said volumes about who this person was, who Taylor Swift really was. After performing at a BMI Songwriters Circle Showcase in 2004 in New York, Swift became the youngest songwriter ever hired by the Sony ATV Tree Publishing House. And they really took a chance on me that I was the youngest person they ever signed. So um, I'd been writing since I was 12 years old and when I was 14 I really started to co-write around Nashville and um, that was really, really fun because I'd been writing by myself. Um, and getting, getting involved in the whole songwriting community in Nashville really helped me along and helped me on my way to, you know, becoming an artist. She left RCA Records when she was 15, when the company wanted her to record the work of other songwriters and wait until she was 18 to release an album. But she felt ready to launch her career with her own material. For me, songwriting is everything, everything. You know, I, I didn't want to sign with a record label that wouldn't let me write all my own music. For me, making an album is about telling stories, making confessions, and writing songs so detailed that each guy knows which song is about him, you know? It's like, they're all very personal. And um, so songwriting has been everything as far as me being an artist and being able to say what I want to say, it's been wonderful. The kid had ice water in her veins. She just knew what she wanted and she had a very, very astonishing sense of self about her. To take that opportunity, which anybody would kill for, a development deal at a major record company like RCA, and basically say, no, I'm, this isn't for me, it's not working, this isn't what I want. Uh, just, it's jaw-dropping. It showed that Taylor didn't just want to be famous. Most people come to town, they'll do whatever it takes to be successful. You know, if, they, if somebody wants them to sing other people's songs, fine. Other people sing their songs, Absolutely, it'll bring in royalties. You know, for Taylor, she 
wanted to be on a record label, but she didn't want to do other people's songs. She wanted to have a publishing deal, but she didn't want other people to do her songs. For a, a, a kid of that age and at that level in her career to basically have, be, have that clear-headed a sense of who she was and what she wanted, I've never seen anything like it. All along, it hasn't been about just being famous. It's been about being successful, doing what she wants to do. She's always had her own vision about how she wanted to do it. And she was willing to give up pretty much a sure thing to do things the way that she wanted to do them. At an industry showcase at Nashville's Bluebird Cafe in 2005, Swift caught the attention of Scott Borchetta, a DreamWorks Records executive who was preparing to form his own independent record label, Big Machine Records. She became one of the label's first signings, with her father purchasing a 3% stake in the fledgling company at an estimated cost of $120,000. Swift began working on her debut album shortly after signing her record deal. After experimenting with veteran Nashville producers, Swift persuaded Big Machine to hire her demo producer, Nathan Chapman. It was his first time recording a studio album, but Swift felt they had the right chemistry. She wrote three of the album's songs alone, including two singles, and co-wrote the remaining eight. Her self-titled debut album was released in October 2006. The New York Times described it as a small masterpiece of pop-minded country, both wide eyes and cynical, held together by Miss Swift's firm, pleading voice. Thank you. This is a song I wrote about ex-girlfriends who don't exactly know that they're ex-girlfriends. I think y'all know what I'm talking about. This is called Permanent Marker. <laughs> I think what was so extraordinary about Taylor's first album is that there were so many hits on the album and as one song would become, you know, go straight to number one, another one was coming out. I think Taylor Swift took everyone by surprise with that first album. I think what took me by surprise was the maturity of this kid. And it started small. It was it was not one of those debut albums that comes out and is at number one on the charts and then kind of falls. It was a build and a build and a build and a build. And it you know, and it kept selling over several years and is still putting up, you know, one or two thousand units every week. So people are still discovering that first album. The dream for me, you know, I always just wanted to make it in country music. That's what I wanted. I mean, I think your dreams change as you start to achieve more of them. I'd love to write songs for other artists. I love to have a double platinum album. You know, I think part of being in this business is being competitive and, and being somewhat restless, always wanting to achieve more than you have. And it's kind of like playing yourself. You know, you want to beat what you've already done. So um, I'm just hoping that, you know, I have a second album that does as well as the first. And, you know, someday get to be a headliner and always, be the same person that I started out as. I first met her in Nashville after she just had just turned 17 and her record had been out for a couple of months and I was really impressed by the record when it came out and that was one of the reasons I went to, to meet with her. That uh, her songs 
sounded very refreshing to me because this was a teenager who was um, happy to sound like a teenager. We'd had uh, the, the Britneys and Christina Aguilera's and performers like that where everybody's trying to move beyond their years. And she was happy being in the years that she was living in. And it sounded very believable. It's been amazing, you know, just all the things that have happened, seeing my album go double platinum, getting to tour with my heroes and topping it all off with like a Grammy nomination. I'm just, I'm really, really in awe of it all. Swift's second studio album, Fearless, was released in November 2008. Swift wrote seven of the album's songs alone, including two singles, and co-wrote the remaining six songs. She co-produced the album with Nathan Chapman. The lead single from the album Love Story was released in September 2008 and became the second best-selling country single of all time. You know, on Love Story, Taylor talks a lot about the kind of trials and travails of being a high school girl and getting your heart broken. She does everything from talk about, you know, a cute boy in her math class she has a crush on to getting her heart broken by a boy who promised to love her forever and always. I think that uh, for Taylor Swift, she still experiences life, love, and disappointment the way the rest of us do. And despite the fact that people may be a lot older or from different cultures or different perspectives, um, I think she really gets to the heart of what all of us feel in those situations, hence her incredible mainstream and widespread appeal. The album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 album chart, with sales of over 500,000 copies and has since sold 8.6 million copies worldwide. I remember talking to her and she was going, I'm so excited for you to, to hear um, where we're going because um, it, it's going to be so much better. Um, and she, you could see how excited she was. And she, you know, in, insisted on playing some things for me. And, you know, uh, she had, had her iPod there and she's zipping through and go, okay, you gotta hear this one, you gotta, and then, oh, what should I play you next? And, and goes on to the next one. So I got a, a preview of it and uh, was uh, impressed by uh, the amount of growth that, that I heard from, you know, two years before. Uh, you could hear now what she was writing about when she was 15 and 16 very, and still in high school, very different than 17 and 18. Now she's, you know, getting up out into the world and her career is really taken off while she still is working on graduating from high school. Swift went on her first headlining tour in support of Fearless and played shows in North America, Europe, Australia and Asia. The tour was attended by more than 1.1 million fans and grossed over $63 million. I'm just so excited. I cannot believe all the sellouts. Like, when I get a call like that, when they're like, oh, by the way, um, the tour sold out Madison Square Garden in a minute. I, I just, I don't know how to react to that other than to just start jumping up and down and screaming. I always expected to have to do a lot of stressing out about selling tickets. And then I went on my first headlining tour and everything just sold out. And I was like, Really, this is how this works? Um, I've never expected that kind of success. I've never just felt entitled to my shows selling out or things like this happening to me, but the fact that they have happened to me has been wonderful. And um, I hope that the second leg of the tour is as successful as the first. This tour has been so amazing because the fans have just absolutely made me feel like I've won the lottery of dreams coming true. Um, when I'm up there and I look down and I see all of these t-shirts that people have made and um, the signs that they make are hilarious. Just very creative. Swift became the first country music artist to win an MTV Video Music Award when You Belong To Me was named Best Female Video in 2009. Her acceptance speech was interrupted by rapper Kanye West, and the incident received much media attention. Everyone was shocked. Here comes Taylor to, you know, receive a very well-deserved reward, and he gets up and makes an absolute idiot of himself, rambling about Beyonce, who looked horrified in the audience. He was not doing her any favors either. And she just handled it very gracefully, incredibly professionally. 
I think what was interesting to me about that whole debacle was that the world, really the world, kind of stood up and said, leave her alone, don't pick on her, we like her. And everybody in the world saw that for what it was. And the way she handled it was classic Taylor. You know, she was just as gracious as ever. I think that's one of those places where she kind of grew up in the public eye because people saw from that that she could handle a crisis situation. And just stay calm, just go on about things. She was very gracious. She never really criticized Kanye, who basically went into hiding after the incident because he had embarrassed himself so badly and ended up apologizing uh, profusely on Twitter uh, for really offending not just Taylor, but really a lot of her fans. Taylor brushed off the incident and went on to end the year in tenacious style. Fearless was named Album of the Year and Best Country Album, while White Horse was named Best Country Song and Best Country Female Vocal Performance. She was the youngest ever artist to win Album of the Year and became the youngest artist and one of only six women to be named Entertainer of the Year by the Country Music Association. Well, tonight I'm just gonna I'm just gonna dance around with my band and my crew and my record label and freak out because honestly, I never imagined that the unattainable thing that I had always held in my mind and my imagination would happen to me at 19. And I've watched every single year of my life, I've watched the CMA Awards. Every single year that I can remember watching CMA Awards. So I know what this means, and that's why I am so at a loss for words right now. Um, so uh, addressing the pace of my career, I feel like I can, I look at it from both ways. Of course, this feels like, it feels like just yesterday that I was knocking on doors of Nashville going, hey, will you listen to my demo? Uh, but then again, I feel so lucky to know you guys and to have talked to you in press rooms and um, to have been an opening act for every single person that I was nominated against in the Entertainer of the Year category. Um, I'm, just, I'm just very appreciative right now. Swift then went on to win four Grammy Awards in 2010 from a total of eight nominations. This is the dream come true. It's, um, it's like I've never been presumptuous about dreams. And um, when you have crazy dreams, like I wonder what it would be like to win a Grammy someday, I, I never actually could fathom that it might happen until I was walking up there and winning one. She released her third studio album, Speak Now, in October 2010. She wrote all 14 songs on the album and co-produced it. Musically, it has been said that the album expands beyond country pop to border both alternative rock and bubblegum pop. The album's lead single, Mine, was released in August 2010, and a further five singles were released throughout 2010 and 2011. I got to uh, get a little preview of it. I was the only journalist allowed into the studio with her while she was recording it. Um, she was out here in Hollywood uh, adding some strings to a couple of the songs back to December and Haunted. And I, I wanted to see uh, how she works creatively behind uh, the mixing board, not just, just in the studio as a, as a singer. And we know how she works as a songwriter. Uh, but to see her um, develop the, the overall sound of, of her records. and. Um, she was so excited to have uh, this like 26-piece orchestra um, being conducted by Paul Buckmaster, a very uh, major orchestrator and arranger conductor in, in pop music circles going back to the days of Elton John's early records. Um, and she was so jazzed uh, to hear the orchestra playing her music uh, because that's the thing that, that really comes across to me, that the most important thing to her in her career is being a songwriter. Speak Now was major commercial success, debuting at number one on the US Billboard 200 chart. 
Its opening sales of 1.5 million copies made it the 16th album in US history to sell 1 million copies in a single week. As a result of selling 20 million albums worldwide, Taylor was presented with a special plaque from Scott Borchetta, representing her 20 million album sales. No, it's too big for me. I can't lift it up. That's gigantic. Wow. Oh, my God. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> what? So, Taylor, that was all checked in. on behalf of Big Machine Records yes, and our partners, Universal Music Group Worldwide, we are so proud to present to you this plaque that indicates you have sold more than 20 million records worldwide. <laughs> And you have to carry that home now. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Oh my gosh. I have to find a wall big enough for this. I'm absolutely blown away by the 20 million records plaque. Um, it's just sort of beyond my comprehension to get a plaque like that. And the fact that the fans have done that much for me in such a short period of time is just unreal. And I'm so excited and so thankful. I remember, you know, coming up in the music industry and like I would make goals for myself that were just ahead of the last goal I had just accomplished. I would never make a goal that was so, um, so far down the line that I felt like it, it was unattainable. A 20 million record plaque in my mind is just always seems unattainable. I never would have imagined that that would be a possibility for a goal. Um, I was hoping to be able to sell one record, you know? Um, be able to make a record, to be able to have songs that people could hear. That's like, the fact that that's happening now and the 20 million plaque is just, it's all the fans and I'm just at a loss again for words. Taylor embarked on the Speak Now World Tour in 2011 and visited Asia, North America, Oceania and Europe. Whoa, hello, London! Welcome to the Speak Now World Tour. I'm Taylor. We have had the honor and the privilege of playing in London many times before. But you have never looked as beautiful as you look tonight at the O2. Finishing the tour in Europe uh, at the O2 Arena in London with a sold out show is, um, I couldn't think of a more perfect way to end this European run. I've gotten to experience just parts of the world I never thought I'd get to see. And nonetheless, play shows in and have the crowds singing the words back to me. As a songwriter, to have people singing the lyrics back to you in countries where they don't even really speak English, it's like, so gratifying and it just it's been a really beautiful tour here and finishing it here at the O2 is just so perfect. <laughs> It was at this point where Taylor started to experiment with her music and created singles for a pop demographic. She went on to release yet another album, Red, which was released in October 2012. The album's lead single, We Are Never Ever Getting Back Together, became Swift's first number one on the US Billboard Hot 100 chart. Production-wise, in terms of the sound of the record, it's, it's very different. Um, it's the first album track that she's ever done where it wasn't just her and her producer Nathan Chapman, where she's working with Max Martin and Shellback out of Sweden. And, you know, those are the guys that make those big dance pop records. And, it's, and so it's, in, in a lot of ways, it's much more like that. It's very much a pop record. There's a country mix to it, but it's really clearly an effort to go make a big pop record, but it's almost like the Swedish dance pop version of what 
an old Taylor Swift song should have sounded like. Yeah, you know, so she's working with different producers, she's working with different songwriters, she's got some guests in on the album, and it's really about seeing what she can learn, seeing what she can do with all of these other people, and, 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 and kind of learning just how broad the Taylor Swift sound is gonna go. We are never ever getting back together, and I Knew You Were Trouble were both international hits. I Knew You Were Trouble was written about One Direction's Harry Styles, who Taylor dated for several months around the time of Red's release. One of the things I think people like about Taylor Swift, particularly her young fans, is that her awkwardness with men. She has been dumped, she has been rejected, and she sings about it very openly. Taylor herself has said, you know, I'm not the girl who always has a boyfriend, I'm the girl who rarely has a boyfriend. And I think a lot of girls who feel awkward of any age uh, can relate to that. So any British men on the horizon? I mean, for what kind of horizon? There's so many different kinds of horizons. On the romantic horizon. I've got nothing on the romantic horizon, come on. <laughs> okay. As part of the Red Tour, Swift played 86 dates in North America, New Zealand, Australia, Europe, and Asia. I'm really excited about being in China for the first time. Uh, it's really exciting to bring the Red Tour here because having never been here, I'm most excited about the fact that the show in Shanghai sold out in under a minute. That was unbelievable. So it makes me even more excited to play the show knowing that there was that much demand here. It's really exciting going somewhere new because I've done so much international touring that you very rarely get to be in an entire country you've never even stepped foot in before. So that kind of experience is always really exciting. And there are lots of different places we're going on this Asia tour where I've, I've never been there before, but surprisingly, we, we, the shows have sold out. So I think that, like I said, that's the most exciting thing that these audiences have been so excited about the show being here. It's, it's hard to try and figure out why my music works so well uh, in Asia and why the fans like it so much. I, I'm honored by the fact that they, you know, even if English isn't their first language, they would learn the words to my songs and sing them back to me in concert. That's, it's really fun for me to know that they put that much effort in. Um, and also it's that kind of amazing reminder that music is one of those unifying factors that works all over the world. And um, looking out into the crowd and being in a completely new place, seeing that it's sold out, seeing that people know the words to the songs, it's really, really incredible. So we're in Shanghai. Uh, we're actually going to do a dress rehearsal to prep for the Asian tour. And although it's predominantly the same set list and production elements as the North American and the things we've done in the UK, it's, uh, it's good to kind of get back in the swing of things. So I'm going to do a dress rehearsal. And everybody's in full costume. So we're going to go do that now to a completely empty arena. Tomorrow, things will look a lot different. <laughs> I, I'm really excited about the idea of touring all over the world and, and putting out albums that will translate all over the world and, um, you know, musically. I think, I think that's been a huge motivating factor for me in making new music is, is making sure that it's music that um, people will love in America and maybe, maybe they'll love in Asia and maybe they'll love in Europe. And that's been a new thing I've really hoped for, um, being able to travel internationally and tour internationally. The Red Tour was attended by 1.7 million fans and grossed over $150 million. Swift won three MTV European Music Awards in 2012, including the honors for Best Female and Best Live Act. I Knew You Were Trouble won Best Female Video at the 2013 MTV Video Music Awards. She was named Best Female Country Artist at the 2012 American Music Awards and was named Artist of the Year at the 2013 ceremony. And in classic Taylor Swift fashion, she was already focusing on her next album. 1989, Swift's fifth studio album was released towards the end of 2014. Taylor described 1989 as her first official pop release and parted ways with some members of her longtime band. As part of the 1989 promotional campaign, Swift invited fans to secret album listening sessions 
called the 1989 Secret Sessions at her houses in New York, Nashville, and Los Angeles. The album's lead single, Shake It Off, was released in August 2014 and reached number one on the Billboard Hot 100. 1989 sold just fewer than 1.3 million copies in the US during the first week of release, selling more copies in its opening week than any album in the previous 12 years. This achievement made Swift the first and only act to have three albums sell more than one million copies in the opening release week. It later became the best-selling album of 2014, selling 3.6 million copies. Swift was named Billboard's Woman of the Year in 2014. She is the only artist to be awarded this title twice. At the 2015 Grammy Awards, Shake It Off was nominated for three awards including Record of the Year and Song of the Year, while at the 2015 Brit Awards, Swift won the International Female Solo Artist Award. In 2017, Swift released her sixth album, Reputation, which was also her last album under Big Machine Records. Publicized celebrity disputes and romantic relationships are what inspired the album's songs, which are about love, vengeance, and ultimately, finding solace in love. She then went on to sign with Republic Records in 2018 and released the eclectic pop album Lover in 2019 and autobiographical documentary Miss Americana in 2020. She embraced indie folk and alternative rock on 2020, albums Folklore and Evermore, and explored understated pop styles on Midnights in 2022. Folklore made Swift the first musician to have seven albums each, selling at least 500,000 copies within the first week of release in the United States. Throughout her musical career, Swift dated stars such as Joe Jonas and Harry Styles. Some songs were also made throughout her career about her lovers, but without Taylor's openness and honesty about her romantic life and exes, we wouldn't have some of her best lyrical work. Most recently, in September 2023, Taylor and Travis have been seen to be in the talking phase of their relationship. Later in that month, the NFL Network's Andrew Siciliano reposts an interview with Travis from August of 2023, in which he asks the footballer about Taylor, in particular, the friendship bracelet. After rumours circulating around the social media realms, sports commentator Ian Eagle hilariously trolls Travis while the Kansas City Chiefs play the Jacksonville Jaguars. As Kelsey scores his first touchdown, he says, Kelsey finds a blank space for the score and makes a shake it off joke to really hammer the point home. Swift was also seen wearing a necklace with Kelsey's birthstone on it, an opal. After some time, the couple were seen positively obsessed with each other, holding hands and spending a lot of one-on-one -on -one time together. It is stated that Kelsey is a gentleman, focused on his career and has a great relationship with his family. All right, so uh, today we get to go ahead and help out the, uh, the Boys and Girls Club in the community of Kansas City. I mean, the, uh, the kids get a chance to come out here and go shopping for their family and kind of get the understanding that, uh, that giving can be just as fun, just as good as receiving. And, um, you know, especially during the holidays, the holidays are, are meant for the family. They're meant to be around and be loved and be happy. And, I mean, it's, uh, it's always been a special time for myself and, and uh, the, the ones that I've, or the loved ones that I have. So, I mean, uh, just coming out here and being able to put a, put a smile on a couple of these kids' faces and maybe give them a, t a few pointers here and there to get to, to what, what to give mother for, uh, for Christmas or for the holidays, so. Do you like to give or receive? Yeah. Oh, without a doubt, give. I mean, it's uh, it's one thing to kind of receive something you you were shocked of, but it's another thing to actually see the smile on someone else's face when you when you hand them a gift and they and they enjoy it and they were like, oh man, I've kind of wanted something like this. So it's just uh, you got you have to be able to to give something to receive something. I mean, it's just it's it's a part of uh, it's a part of my heart to really be able to give something out. 
it's an awesome time of the year. The holidays are, are right around the corner, if not here already. So, I mean, heck, the lights on the plaza have already been lit. So it's one of those deals where everybody's getting in the, in the mood of things and being able to give back to the ones that they love or the ones they care about. You, you have to be in the community for how much the, the, the community supports us. And what do you do around the holidays? Do you take some time off and relax, or are you just going to be um, football's one hard? Of the, football's <laughs> one of those deals where you, uh, if you're if you're in the hunt, I mean, you're uh, you really don't have that much time to kind of sit around. It's one, it's a, uh, it's been fun for me this past year, just because I've been with the Chiefs and we've been able to be in the hunt for the playoffs, be be in the hunt to you know do well in the playoffs and things like that. So it's uh, it's fun to be around the team and sometimes you get to see the family come in and exchange the gifts and sit around and eat ham and turkey and all that fun stuff but uh, at the same time you gotta you gotta take care of business and that's that's definitely what we want to do here what does it mean to play for the Chiefs what's it like being in Kansas City how does that mean to oh, you man it's uh it's been it's uh, it's meant a lot more since I've been here I mean just to see how much this community rallies around the Chiefs and even the Royals at that I mean it's it's an awesome 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 town sports town at that and I mean for uh for a, an athlete to come into this city after being in different cities, I, I've recognized different areas and not, not every single city, not every single team gets as much support as Kansas City gets. So, I mean, for me to be here, I, I just want to give back everything that they give to me just because, I mean, I, uh, I enjoy every single home, home game up at Arrowhead and everything like that, so. The couple have been seen to bring the new year in with a kiss with Swift's first appearance at Kelsey's game in Kansas City becoming one of the year's most buzzed about moments, the couple have been seen to be the happiest together and have reported feeling like they've known each other for years. They've been able to develop a mutual connection and desire for each other and are said to share many similar interests. Taylor has officially stated, when you say a relationship is public, that means I'm going to see him do what he loves. We're showing up for each other. Other people are there and we don't care. We're just proud of each other. Taylor and Travis, the new romance.